In late September of 2019, just four years ago, Tim Keller paid a visit to our Discover the Word studio at Our Daily Bread Ministries. Tim's books and videos and sermons had really had an impact on our group, and we just wanted to have him join us at the table if we could. Uh, We'd been trying to schedule them for several years, and, uh, well, it finally worked out. And it was a great day spending time with him. Well, less than a year later, Tim revealed that uh, he'd been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And on May 19 of this year, 2023, he passed away at the age of 72. And so what we're going to do in this edition of the Discover the Word podcast is remember that day, September 20, 2019, when we recorded a week of conversations with Tim Keller on a topic that uh, was kind of a surprise to us. Now, we asked him what he'd like to talk about, and he said that he'd like to talk about what he called the first Christian sexual revolution. This week, we're going to be looking at what the Bible says about marriage and sexuality. And we're going to be noticing that when Christianity burst onto the scene in the first century, it spoke about many, many things, but one of the things it brought was a revolutionary view of sexuality. And so pull your chair up to the table as Tim Keller talks with the Discover the Word group about the first Christian sexual revolution and whether the more recent sexual revolution that seems to have started back in the 1960s is a step forward or is actually somewhat of a step back. Remember our visit with Tim Keller next on Discover the Word. And welcome to the Discover the Word podcast, the small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries with your friends Marty Hahn, Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Daniel Ryan Day, and Rasul Berry. Over the years, we found that spending this time together has made this table that we sit around a place where our faith has grown. And from time to time, we've also had guests join us, and those times are always significant growth times for us as well. And one of those weeks was one we spent with author and pastor Tim Keller. As I said, Tim had been on our list for quite a while because his approach to Scripture and the Gospel definitely had an effect on how we do discover the Word. And so we were really thankful that it worked out for him to join us here at the table and talk about the first Christian sexual revolution. Because it'd be tough to deny that our society is obsessed in so many ways with our sexuality. So I think this conversation definitely dealt with an extremely relevant topic. Bill Crowder was on the producer's side of the glass with me for this conversation. Rasul had not yet joined us as a regular part of the group, and so it was Mart and Elisa and Daniel at the table welcoming Tim Keller to Discover the Word. Well, Tim, we've never met before, but I kind of feel like you're among friends here. We feel like we know you. Yeah, it's the way in which I was going to say we have a new friend at the table, but he feels like an old friend. Yeah, yeah. So we're really excited that you're here. So thanks for coming. Yeah, and we've been waiting, haven't we? Yeah. Least, I think we've time. been working on in this conversation <laughs> about three years to see when you'd be available, Tim. What do you want to talk about? Well, I'd like to talk about the idea of the sexual revolution, which we immediately think of something that happened in the 60s and 70s. Hmm. So looking around the table, I'm not sure everybody here remembers the 60s and the 70s. Um, Why are you looking straight at me? (laughs) (laughs) But um, uh, we think of that as a sexual revolution, but I'd like to make the case, or I'd like to talk about the fact that the first sexual revolution in the world was the Christian approach to sex, which burst onto the world in the first century. And you can really see it, especially in 1 Corinthians 6 and 7, but elsewhere in the Bible. So I thought maybe could we read one passage from 1 Corinthians 6 and just throw this one idea out and hear what you think. Okay, and as we look for it, you're saying the first sexual revolution it was really a Christian one. In human history, you're yeah, talking about? Yeah, really. It was the first time that something, Christianity brought the first real revolutionary new approach to sexuality. And so I'd like to at least establish that first and talk a little bit about that. And then go talk about whether or not the new sexual revolution is actually progress. It's actually retrograde, maybe. Hmm. Huh. Look at 1 Corinthians six thirteen to 17. This is Paul writing. He says to the Corinthians, obviously, you say food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. 
By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Hmm. Okay, now think about answering this question. Considering Paul speaking into the Greco-Roman world, Mm -hmm. just think of whatever else you know about that world. How is what he's saying here seem revolutionary? What about what he's saying here is directly contradicting and sort of overthrowing the ordinary way people thought about sex? Would this be a time where even just the reference to prostitutes, that prostitution and the worship of certain gods was one and the same, that that would happen in worship? I don't know if it was in worship, but I do know you're right about the reason he's saying to uh, people, you know, if you're a Christian, you don't use prostitutes. That was actually revolutionary. Hmm. Here's one thing I do know is that in that world, if you're a wife, you had to have sex with your husband only. That's it. But if you were a husband before and after marriage, it was expected that men had sex whenever they wanted to. It was just understood. Mm. Socially Uh, acceptable. Yeah, totally acceptable, whether you're married or not. And prostitution was just normal. Everybody Mm. used prostitutes. And also homosexuality was pretty normal. In other words, you could, if you're married, you obviously, she couldn't have sex with anybody else because everybody had to know Mm. who the children that she was going to bear. Oh, that was the reason. They belonged. That's mm-hmm. right. He had to know who it was belonged to because, you know, there was a stratified society and I had to make sure that my children had the right pedigree. But men, it was expected, could have sex with anybody. You could have sex with your servants. You could make them have sex with you. Prostitutes all over the place. So Paul brings that up because that was just utterly normal. Empire-wide. Yeah, pretty much. So you're right. That's the first thing. Just when Paul comes along and says, no, there is no double standard. Yeah. Sorry, not only the wives have to be faithful to the husbands, the husbands have to be faithful to the wives. Yeah. And that was just crazy. I'm trying to imagine how men would have heard this and how women would have mm. heard this in listening to I'm this. so glad that the woman <laughs> in the room immediately, <laughs> what do you think? If this is the standard that she mm. is chaste and he has been given a lot of freedom, right. I would think there'd be great relief there also might be great pressure. <laughs> yes, there was, but uh-huh. you know, you're totally right. I mean, the fact is that women loved the first sexual revolution. Mm-hmm. It's very, very clear. Women were just astounded at it. How do we know that? Oh, well, read Rodney Stark's book, uh, The Rise of Christianity. Any of the historians of that time will tell you. You know, in many ways, it was just liberating for women. But actually, there's another part of this text that tells you where he's going after the attitude of the time. Can you see it? Well, I know the part that jumped out to me is when we got to the end in verse 17, and he's making this contrast between being united in a way with a prostitute and is instead saying that we're to be united with God. You're absolutely right again. What he's actually saying is, and this is the revolution, the way the Lord united with you has to be the paradigm or the pattern with which men and women unite. Hmm. In other words, the point is your relationship with God is an exclusive one. You give yourself wholly to him. He gives himself wholly to you. In Jesus Christ, you say, well, how does God give himself to us? This thing called the incarnation, the Mm -hmm. atonement. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Jesus Christ, God lost his immortality, came down here, became subject to death, goes to the cross. In other words, he gave himself for us. That's the heart of the gospel. He gave himself completely for us. And then to know him, we give ourselves completely to him. That's a, a permanent, mutual absolutely exclusive relationship. Hmm. And what Paul is saying is that's the only way sex should be used. Our sexuality has to be based on the pattern of God's saving love. And that pattern is not like, you know, well, if you have a relationship with God, you can have a relationship with other gods, go ahead. Hmm. You know, you can serve God and you can serve your career and you can serve this and you can serve that. No, God is your only Lord. And of course he has given himself for you. And therefore sex is only between a man and woman exclusively. In marriage, you don't have sex with anybody else outside. Mm-hmm. That was just totally wild. Tim, if somebody says, oh, wait a minute, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you're speaking in ideals. I mean, first of all, who among us can say that we have given ourselves totally and completely and without reservation to our 
to our God, yeah. to our Savior. Right. It seems like all of life is a struggle and all the time we're somewhere falling short. Yeah, that doesn't mean, look, when my wife and I gave ourselves to each other, we said, you're first in my life, honey. And I gotta tell you, <laughs> we, spent, we spent the last 45, 47, eight years basically falling short of that. But it doesn't mean we say, oh, then I guess since we're not perfect, we might as well just go ahead and, mm -hmm. you know, I might as well just- Give ourselves to somebody else. Yeah, no, I, yeah. and of course, don't forget, I do think that when I say you're first in my life, it's not just that I could literally commit adultery with another woman, but I could commit spiritual adultery of sorts with both God and my wife if I live more for my ministry and my career than for her. Mm -hmm. If I put, you know, fame and fortune ahead of my wife, mm -hmm. which plenty of people do, especially where I come from in New York. Mm -hmm. I mean, people sacrifice their families in order to get successful. And then next thing you know, they're on their third and their fourth wives and all that. In fact, somebody actually said New York is the biggest pagan society in the world because it still practices child sacrifice. Mm -hmm. so, in what sense? In the sense that they're sacrificing their children so that they can make more money. They're just working uh, day and night, just saying my career and my money is more important. So, of course, we're not going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. But basically, nevertheless, the ideal is still the thing that we're shooting for, which is okay. I get married. Sex is only within marriage. Although I can't have sex, maybe we'll get to that some other days. I don't have sex with somebody I haven't given my whole life to. Mm -hmm. But basically, that's the pattern. Was it scandalous? for Paul to talk about being one with Jesus Christ in the metaphor. Yeah, you know, that, at least that's really wise. You mean in a sexual way? Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's, it doesn't that. exactly say it, but it, there's no doubt the idea of communion with God, mm -hmm. an intimate love relationship with God, that was totally new. And actually, even today, I was in a dialogue with um, a Muslim cleric once in which it was really good and we learned from each other, but he just said, we do not talk about a love relationship with Allah. You cannot be friends or have a love relationship with Allah because he's too high and we're too low. And mm -hmm. So this idea, yes, it was very daring mm -hmm. to say because of this intimate union we have with Jesus Christ, our sex life has to mirror that. Mm -hmm. We have to base it on the idea of uh, the saving love of God, which is always mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. Before our time's up, there is one more thing I'll just point out. When he says, Food for the stomach and the stomach for food and God what, will destroy Where are you now? What, what In the very beginning, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 6, 13. All right. You notice in most translations, it's a, a little bit of a proverb. It's usually in quotes. Mm -hmm. And what he means there is sex is just like eating. That was the attitude of the time, was that sex is like an appetite. If you get hungry, you eat. Hmm. There's nothing right or wrong about that. Yeah. Maybe you could overeat. But basically, eating isn't a moral thing. You just, you need it. And sex is the same way. That basically sex is just an appetite. So just when you feel you need the sex, you go do it. And Paul is saying, no, it's a sacred thing. It's not an appetite. It's something for an exclusive relationship, just the way God's love for us has to create an exclusive relationship. And there's no double standard. And it was a complete revolution. The first revolution. The said. first sexual revolution that ever came into the world was the Christian sexual revolution. Yeah, in this edition of the Discover the Word podcast, we're listening to a memorable conversation that we had with the late pastor, Tim Keller. In a lot of ways, he had a profound impact on how we study the Bible together. And so we wanted to look back on that day a little over four years ago when Mark DeHaan, Lisa Morgan, and Daniel Ryan Day recorded with him this series about the first Christian sexual revolution. Now, in this next segment, uh, we're going to hear Tim explain why for thousands of years people thought of gods dwelling in a building, in a structure, in a temple. But in the New Testament, we read that God sent the Holy Spirit to dwell within every believer, that we are God's temple, the temple of the Holy Spirit. It was a revolutionary way to think about our body, and it's a huge part of the first Christian sexual revolution. Why our body isn't just our body when it comes to sexuality. That's where the conversation with Tim Keller went next. So I'd like to uh, keep looking at 1 Corinthians 6 and 7, and I'm wondering whether it looks to me like we do have a designated reader <laughs> here in Grand Rapids. We do. We do. And I would like her, <laughs> so, now, so now we know who I'm talking about, I would like her to read the very end of six and a little bit of the beginning of seven. Okay, if you do that. here we go. 
Okay, this is Paul writing to the church in Corinth, and I'm going to pick it up in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Mm-hmm. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. In chapter 7, we'll pick up in verse 3 through 5 here. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise, the wife to her husband. And at least I've got there, okay. should fulfill his wife's sexual needs. Okay, so specific so that, yeah. there. Okay. And then verse 4, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer, and then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of Mm self-control. So now we're exploring how Christianity brought a, a very revolutionary view of sex into the world. And this time, I'd like you to see, I'd like us to talk about how the Christian attitude toward the body Hmm. the physical body, how that was different than the one that the culture had. And I guess we could even say maybe even different than than what we have now. So is there anything in there that we just read that might be, you know, something that you would say, well, that probably was pretty different. How do we know? Well, certainly the first part where it says, do you not know your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Sure. That's different. Why was it different? Well, it's radical that the Holy Spirit would dwell inside a body yes. in such a way. Usually the temple was a place you a go place. to. So exactly. Yeah. Physical. And yeah. the priest only went once a year and et cetera, right? Into the yeah. Exactly. In other words, mm-hmm. the temple was a holy place. Mm-hmm. I mean, whatever the temple was, you went to the temple because the God was there, but it wasn't out somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And so the idea that the body would be a place where God's spirit world it does not fit in with the greek yeah. and roman idea at all yeah. my body your body yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. and this passage kind of reinforces what we talked about in our last conversation because it ends with for you were bought with a price therefore glorify god in your body and so you have that idea of that we don't belong to ourselves we belong to christ so you have the temple idea mixed with this idea of what we talked about last time of this unique union only with god because of what he did for and us. And bought with the prices. Also, these phrases, you know, they go kind of crazy in your head and echo. Doesn't it kind of smack of slavery there being bought with a price? That's radical too. Yeah, but what matters though is that if you belong to God, then your body matters. Yeah. I think we even today have a sense of this, that the Greeks and the Romans, for example, you've heard of a platonic relationship, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, the platonic relationship means what? In your mind. It's in your mind, but not. A, apart from sex. Right. Why? Because it's Plato. Why? Because the Greeks actually did have this idea that the mind and the spirit were good and the body was not. Yeah. That the body was sort of uh, less important. And besides that, the body eventually dies and mm-hmm. is destroyed and the soul goes on. And that was the Greek idea that, you know, the body's not that important. A kind of a discardable container for the real you, which is the soul. So what you did with your body didn't matter, including sex. You could kind of do a lot of things with your body. But matter to who? I mean... Well, it didn't matter to God. It didn't matter to the gods. They didn't care about the body. They only cared about the spirit. Because the people were indulging themselves. They were loving it. Right. But the gods didn't care about what you did with the body. What they cared Mm. about is what you did with your soul. Uh. But this God, the true God, our God, does care about what you're going to do with your body. And uh, after all, Jesus Christ, you know, took on a body... He was incarnated. He was resurrected in the body. God's going to, uh, he not only created soul and body, he's going to redeem both soul and body. And that really changes things. It means uh, that, you know, what you do with your body really matters. And that's what Paul's saying. And that's very, very different. And you're saying in Greek society, that would be a far more drastic, stunning thought. And it was so stunning that a lot of the early church in councils and in these gatherings was arguing about whether Jesus had a physical body or not. And if he did, then it was good. They even started to teach at one point that it was good that he died because he was able to discard his physical body. And you have studied your church history, brother. (laughs) (laughs) And and that's right. And they were falling back into Greek thought at that point Mm. instead of being biblical, whereas the body is a good thing. Mm. That's exactly right. 
you can see why it was revolutionary then, but here's my question. Is there anything about our culture today that shows people are saying, well, really, the body isn't actually important. What really matters is my inner self. Mm -hmm. Can you see that or not? I'm trying to figure out where we see it. Um, well, I actually think people are worshiping the body too. Our fitness, our beauty crazes. Yeah, and We do worship true. our body too. And we also then separate into our spirit and think that's more mm -hmm. holy than the bodies. So maybe there's still some separation going on. Well, I think about it in church contexts where we always emphasize when we leave here to get there, meaning heaven, when we mm -hmm. get rid of this physical world and our physical bodies so that we can get to heaven where then we can really be united with yep. God. And here he's almost saying, no, 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 the uniting has already happened. Yep. It's not some future hope that we have, although maybe it'll be more realized in a future sense. But right now, this is a present reality of God being united to you in this physical body that the Greek and Roman world would say isn't important. Oh, yeah. The body is not a discardable container, the way the Greeks said. Mm -hmm. But I do see some things happening today that seems like a bit of a throwback to the old idea that what matters is my inner okay. self and not my body. It's also true a lot of people do hate their bodies. Mm -hmm. People who have had a lot of disabilities, yeah. mm -hmm. a lot of people feel like their bodies are their enemy. Yeah. And that's because we live in a fallen world in which everything's flawed. And yet I, as a pastor, I've been trying to say to folks who really don't like their bodies and almost say, I can't wait to be rid of my body, mm -hmm. said, the salvation is that you get a new body, not that you get rid of your body. Uh, yeah. And therefore, the body is a good thing. It's a radical thing. And I keep using that word because I think it's true that the God of the universe would choose to dwell in us yes. rather than in a temple, but yeah. in us. And just personally, you know, when I age, <laughs> when I go through various seasons with my body, that thought is so humbling. And yet, and it goes back to what we talked about in a previous conversation, it's incredibly endearing and intimate that God mm -hmm. loves me that mm -hmm. much yep. that he wants to dwell with me in that kind of a relationship. Yeah. And you know, I think anybody can identify with a moment where they've seen themselves and didn't like what they saw. Right. Oh. Who hasn't? Right. Who hasn't? Right. Yeah. And so what's so powerful in this is the fact that even in that moment, God is saying, no, 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 you're my temple. I live in you. Mm -hmm. I chose you as how I want to be represented. And so even in those moments of looking at ourselves and not liking what we see, there's an essence in which God is saying, I do like what I he see. He is affirming your body. Yeah. And he's affirming you. By the way, you think there's anything revolutionary, especially in that day and time, for Paul to say, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. But in the same way, yeah. the husband ding, does ding, not ding. have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. That's the shocker, isn't it? Yeah. It is a shocker because it's actually saying sex is consensual. Mm -hmm. And that actually the husband doesn't own the wife's body any more than the wife owns the husband body. In other words, it's mutual. Mm -hmm. And the idea that sex is consensual is a Christian idea. Mm -hmm. When Theodosius, Roman emperor, 428, I think, or something like that, made a law that said no woman should be forced to have sex against her will. That was a new idea in the world. It came mm -hmm. from Christianity. It was absolutely crazy, and it's still with us. Mm -hmm. But most people today who actually do say sex has to be consensual between consenting adults don't realize that's a Christian idea. Powerful. And it came from the idea, by the way, that the body is the Lord's, and nobody has the right. You, know, you can mutually give your body to each other, but the body is the Lord's, and no man can own a woman's body. No woman can own a man's body, except by mutual consent in a marriage. And that was a part of the first sexual revolution, which was the Christian sexual revolution. It truly was and is a revolutionary way of looking at our sexuality. You're listening to a special conversation here on Discover the Word when Marty Hahn, Elisa Morgan, Daniel Ryan Day, and the late author and pastor Tim Keller were at the table together. As I mentioned earlier, this recording was back in September of 2019, not long before Tim was diagnosed with the pancreatic cancer that took him earlier this year. And so we wanted to look back at these conversations and remember our friend who had such an impact on our generation for Christ. And so in the next part of the conversation, Tim addressed the issue of marriage 
and the effect this revolution had on how people thought about and lived out in a new way, marriage. Now, today, many feel like marriage is kind of an outdated institution and not much more than just a piece of paper. So is that true? Well, they'll get into that after we take a quick break. Now, if you're familiar with Tim Keller's writing, do you have a favorite book of his? Maybe the one about marriage called The Meaning of Marriage, or The Reason for God, or the one called Prodigal God. Those are all really good. But we'd like to recommend to you as well one that contains a lot of the things that have so shaped our approach to Bible study here on Discover the Word. This book is called King's Cross, The Story of the World in the Life of Jesus. Uh, Tim wrote this excellent book to explore the life of Christ in detail. And in it, as always, he had fresh insights into the life of Jesus that helped us discover how his life, how Jesus' life, changes ours. Look for a link to order a copy of King's Cross, The Story of the World and the Life of Jesus by Tim Keller when you visit our website online at discovertheword.org. Or if that link isn't on our site anymore, you can search any of the online booksellers by typing King's Cross by Tim Keller into the search bar and it should come right up. And now let's listen to how Tim Keller pointed the group to a key passage of the Bible about marriage in Genesis chapter 2, and then proceeded to give a persuasive perspective that spoke to the value of marriage, both in the ancient world and in our world today. So let's read Genesis 2.24. Who'd like to do that? Pick me! Okay. Uh, <laughs> that person way over in the corner, <laughs> waving her hand. The shy one? Yeah. The shy one. Okay, okay here we go. <laughs> that is why... This is right after God has created Eve from Adam. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. So this verse is uh, only one verse in Genesis, except, of course, Jesus pulls it out Mm -hmm. in the New Testament, so it's maybe the verse when it comes to talking about marriage. So here's a question. Let me pose this question to you. Uh, Over the years, I have talked to plenty of young couples. In fact, uh, The church we started in 1989 was at one point about 90% single. At one point we actually had almost a thousand people coming and there were only five children in the the whole whole church. (laughs) We had three and this one other couple had two. And that was no trouble for babysitting there. You (laughs) know, we didn't have any problem with that. But um, an awful lot of those couples said, I don't know why I have to get married because marriage is just a piece of paper. You know, we love each other. We're committed to each other. Marriage is just a piece of paper. Yeah. And, you know, really, when you talk about Jesus picking up later on, that was within a context of divorce, wasn't it? Where divorce yeah, that's had true. become that's a true. huge issue. Yeah. So what would you say? Come on. Yeah, help me. I'm a pastor. I'm, <laughs> I, I don't need to be married. We love each other. Actually, uh, my book, Meaning of Marriage, I actually heard a podcast by a couple of pretty secular, you know, young women who read the book and then they decided to report on it, believe it or not. And one of the th- things that they were very upset about was this idea that you need to be married. <laughs> I remember this one woman said, I was a young woman, she said, I have a boyfriend and we live together and we are never going to be married. Mm. We just don't believe in it. Then she said, but there were still good things in the book. You know, which <laughs> yeah, I thought was you know very, what? what would you say to her? Well, I, first of all, I, I think I understand a little bit mm-hmm. of why there are so many people who just feel that I don't want to go through that again. I yep. saw my mom and dad mm. go through okay, that. That's... I know the incredible pain. I watched my mom, I watched my dad, I watched what it did to our family. Yeah. And then they begin to see that this isn't just their family. This is happening all over the place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In mm-hmm. fact, for a while, it seemed like most people, it was getting close to 50%, wasn't it? Yeah. It, uh, by yeah. depends on how you yeah, figure no, no. your, mm-hmm. your math. Mm-hmm. But there's a part of me that says, good night, I get it. Mm-hmm. We have a generation and generations born into a world where marriage is probably one of the most violent, painful places yeah. you could be. So I feel like we have to get it. We got to admit, okay, wait a minute. Uh, Mark, you're very understanding. <laughs> yes, he is. And I do think you're right that the first <laughs> yeah. shoe that drops has to be, I understand why you'd be so reluctant. Yeah. yeah. But then they want to go all the way and say that marriage is just a piece of paper, therefore kind of worthless and useless. And I don't think we want to, after we've been understanding, is there any well, way we can come back and say, 
It's more than that. Give me one more sentence. If it's more than that, I don't think we can say it in a word. True. They got to see it. So oh, I got yes, you. I and got you. you know, at this table, we have very long-term marriages. Really, four very long-term marriages, especially according to our ages. You know, mm. I've been married forty years, and yeah, around the table, 50, 50 and Daniel. nearly fifty. And Daniel, at your young age, have been married twelve years. Yeah. Okay. Of course, I got shoes that are older. Than yeah, Daniel's yeah. Marriage, <laughs> but that's anyway, that's right. a lot. So, in saying what I said, <laughs> please understand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I no. get it. Yeah, I get that marriage is hard for one thing, mm-hmm. and I've seen people broken over and over mm-hmm. again. True. So. I would not be someone who would say, you're right, it's just a piece of paper. Well, then what, how would you make a case then? Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're trying to encourage people, though, to be married, what would you say? How would you say, well, it doesn't have to just be a piece of paper. Well, I mean, what would you, how would you argue why marriage could be good for love? I think I would talk about the promise and the commitment that comes with a sacred moment of saying that this relationship is different from other relationships that I've had in the past. Okay. It's a moment where I'm committing to her, she's committing to me, but then the real hard work starts. <laughs> yeah. And to your point, Mart, I think one of the reasons I have a high value of marriage is because I saw a mom and dad that went before me that didn't get mm-hmm. divorced and had a high value yeah. of marriage. Mm-hmm. And then I've been surrounded by mentors that have right. these long-term marriages where I see there's something different there than right. relationships that don't have that. So what is that thing? And it's often this self-sacrificial core commitment that they have that shows that there is a better way. And I want to experience that with my wife. Yeah, that there's more than a promise of yeah. love. To whatever extent we learn to love, Yeah. then we begin to discover why this thing is of so much growth. Yeah. Not only for ourselves, but for our children, for mm-hmm. our friends. If the comeback is... Are you trying to say that making a legal commitment is somehow more loving mm-hmm. or enhances love? How does it do that? I mean, that's, I think, the pushback is saying, I'm just as loving as committed mm-hmm. to my boyfriend, that's what she was saying, mm-hmm. as somebody who's gotten married. And let me play this out then, Tim. Is it possible that the kind of commitment that the scriptures value and promote as being the way of God is it possible that that could exist without a piece of paper? First of all, even here, now see the word united, mm-hmm. the old King James said, uh, um, this is why a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. I'm sorry, I'm old enough that I love the old <laughs> language. <laughs> yeah. The cleave actually means actually to be glued. Uh-huh. And it, by the way, the word there, united, the Hebrew word is a word that in Deuteronomy is translated make a legal binding covenant. Uh-huh. Now, I think to answer Mart's question, on the one hand, the Bible is for all peoples, all places, all times. And so legality, I'm sure, meant something different. And I suppose Mm. that there are certainly places where jumping over a broom handle was all it took. You didn't have to sign anything. You didn't. But I guess the answer, your older question a few minutes ago, you said, would it be possible for a person to be as committed to someone without a marriage contract yeah. as with a marriage contract the answer is yes and no because if you're that committed you're permanently committed you say i'm never leaving you ever under any circumstances unconditionally i'm committed to you then i don't know why you're not married actually yeah. i mean why wouldn't you get married that's my big question to her for example if right. i knew her i would say if you are as committed to your boyfriend mm-hmm. as a woman is committed to her husband legally and who's married already why wouldn't you get married? And actually, when I have asked that question, most people do say, because people change and I want to be able to get out if I want to get out. And I said, at that point then, what you're really saying is, here's where I'm being a little bit convicting, I hope, is actually I don't love him enough to marry him. And to provide the legal security. That's right, that's right. Because when you marry, what you're really saying is, I'm not promising to feel loving toward you, I'm promised to to love you. Mm -hmm. I'm promising to be loving regardless of how I feel. And I think when that happens, when you're willing to say that, then there's twofold. On the one hand, it's actually an evidence of that kind of love. Mm -hmm. So my marriage, the covenant is a kind of a, it's a test of my love. It's a little bit like Ulysses supposedly, Mm -hmm. when he was on his boat, he heard about that he was going to go by the island of the Sirens. And the sirens were these women who evidently he had heard that when they sing and when you hear the song, you're going to go mad and you're going to drive your boat toward the island and you will Mm. 
crash on the on the shoals and all that sort of thing. So what he did was he tied himself to the mast and he put wax in the ears of his sailors and he said, now I'm going to go crazy temporarily when you get near the island and I'm going to yell at you, I'm going to scream, and I'm going to say, cut me loose and let me go and uh, you just ignore me. Because he wanted to experience this. He said he knew he was going to experience okay. it. I don't know. It's a legend. Because he didn't put wax but in his But he knew he was going to experience right. it. Okay. I also know I'm going to go crazy and you've got to ignore it. In a sense, when you make a marriage covenant, you're tying yourself to the mask. And you're saying, I may have periods in which I really want out of here, but I want to stick with it so okay. that when I come back to my senses, I'm still in a marriage. Okay, so is it just a matter of morality then? Is that what we're doing? Arguing? No, no, no. It's a test of love. And then it's a means of love. Frankly, it's a little bit like the Lord's Supper. Because in the Lord's Supper, what I'm doing is I'm remembering everything that Jesus has done for me, and I'm renewing my commitment to him. Mm. And in a way, a marriage uh, is a covenant in which I uh, originally make that commitment, but then as time goes on, I have to renew it. Somebody but the oath that. actually helps me renew it because I really, I've made the promise. But if somebody says, I don't want to make the promise because I can't do it, I know myself. Well, then you maybe don't love the person enough to get married and you shouldn't. Maybe I'm playing hardball here, but I do think it's a fair test. I think a covenant is a test of whether you love the person enough. And then after you actually do get married, it becomes a way of strengthening the love. So what I try to say is, even if you're scared, make the commitment, because then after that, the commitment will actually strengthen mm. your love. Mm. Yeah. It starts as a test of love, and then it becomes a, a promise. Yeah. I think one thing that's missing in our conversation, though, is what happens right before this. Mm. And that is the fact that you have God creating, and he's creating man in his image, and as the Bible unfolds, we learn that the image of God is this relational unity between these three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And there's this love that they share and this relationship that they share. And so he creates a man and a woman, and then he brings them together. And it's by his spirit. By his spirit that they can even commit this, hey, even in our what will be brokenness, which it's not broken yet, mm -hmm. but that comes. And pray for the love that it takes yes. to keep that commitment in the hard times. Because love yeah. really isn't even mentioned here. Yeah. yeah. Daniel's quite right in saying that the context here is the triune God has made us in his image and that when we are uniting in some ways, we're imaging him and so he's present in the relationship. Mm -hmm. I think if you make that marriage promise, as far as I can see, that's how the spirit strengthens your love and your ability. So if you say, I'm afraid I'm not strong enough to make this marriage promise, I want to say, well, maybe you aren't. Maybe you're not ready to marry this person. But I also want you to realize that the way the Holy Spirit is going to help you stay faithful to your spouse is through the promise. Because I know after 45 years, many times I remember thinking, this is really hard. And then I say, but I made a promise. And the Spirit uses that at that moment. So you don't want to say, well, here's the promise, but how does the Holy Spirit work? The Holy Spirit works through the promise. Mm -hmm. So I really think even though younger people are really afraid to make that commitment, I would say on the one hand, making a covenant commitment, a legal promise to be married is both a sign of love. It does take love to do it, but then it becomes the thing that strengthens the love on the other side. And that's what I don't think they know. They're afraid that they won't be able to live up to it, but it actually becomes an enhancer. So it's a mm -hmm. test of love, but it's also an enhancer of love opening part of this discussion about the value of commitment in marriage. And that's an intriguing and memorable way of looking at it. It's more than a piece of paper. There's something special about making that promise before God, saying no matter what, we're going to get through this together. It's both a test of love and an enhancer of the love. Well, in the next part of this discussion, Mart and Elisa and Daniel and Tim Keller talked about why God created both male and female and how men, women, marriage, and singleness all work into God's perfect plan for humankind. It's another key aspect of the first Christian sexual revolution. Daniel, you got to do it this time. Okay. Right. <laughs> do what? Like do what? To, well, I want you to read about male and female, Daniel. Okay. Okay. Probably the two classic verses are Genesis 1:27, okay, and 2:18. All right, so Genesis 1, So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. 
And then chapter 2, verse 18 of Genesis. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. Hmm. So one of the most important aspects of the Christian sexual revolution, and I'd like to talk about this very directly like this, Paul was very, very, let's put it this way, very positive about the idea of marriage being between a man and a woman. Much more positive, you might say, about it than the Greco-Roman world was. But the basis for it was, I think, this stuff right here, where the text is talking about the fact that maleness and femaleness somehow together reflect the image of God in a way that neither one reflects all by itself. Mm -hmm. No matter how you read this, it seems like that's got to be the implication. So God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God created he them, male and female he created them. So are you saying that the likeness could not exist in the male alone? It seems no, like I, it. It's intriguing that the very first thing the Bible says, I mean, in fact, before the sentence is over, the minute the Bible talks about us being made in the image of God, it immediately talks about gender. Mm -hmm. First thing. There's a whole lot of other things that we would say are the results of being in the image of God. We can talk about irrationality. Mm -hmm. We can talk about personality. We can talk about all sorts of things. But it's fascinating. The very first thing it says mm -hmm. reflects the image of God is the fact that we're in two genders here. And yet, as time goes on, I'd like you to respond to this question. I keep looking through the Bible for lists of traits of masculinity and femininity. Mm -hmm. It's obviously extremely clear that you need both maleness and females to reflect the image of God. So, okay, shouldn't there be a list? Right. Now, these are the things the man is, these are the things the woman we is. We try to make there be lists. I can't sometimes. find them. <laughs> yeah. I can't no. find yeah. any. I think we try to make there be lists, like a gentle and quiet spirit. Well, that's a girl. So you don't want guys to be gentle. See, that's the yeah. problem. Yeah. Yes, exactly. you do. Exactly. Right. And God does describe himself mm -hmm. with male and female characteristics yes, at times. Yes, true. Which is interesting. If you say, well, women are more gentle and men are more courageous but you no, you don't want cowardly women and you don't want, you right know, yeah you, right. you don't want harsh men right. and yeah. then you begin to say okay well where is it then what is maleness and femaleness mm -hmm. yeah, and we look at history and we see very courageous women mm -hmm. yeah and right. we look at history and see right. very courageous men and some of the men that have made the biggest difference in the world are gentle quiet spirited right. men right. Yeah. so are there any differences? But there seem mm -hmm. like there have to be. Mm -hmm. Well, there are reproductive differences. Biological, yes. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to argue that one. Mm -hmm. Though it's interesting, I think it's interesting, that God could just be creating new human beings if mm -hmm. he wanted to. Mm -hmm. There could be a place where they just appear. Sure. Right? <laughs> That'd be fun. I think there's some movies that do stuff yeah, like that, right. actually. <laughs> on the other hand, what he has bestowed on human beings is the ability to create new human life. Mm -hmm. But it only happens through the union of a male and a female. Right. Something that the male only can produce mm -hmm. and something that the female only yeah. can produce have to be united. Yeah. Right. Now, everybody agrees with that, that those two things have to come together. The real question then is, is there anything besides the biological? Mm -hmm. And by the way, I'm not fishing for an answer in my head that I'm trying mm -hmm. to get you to say because mm -hmm. I don't have one. Yeah. yeah. So does there need to be some kind of maleness or femaleness beyond just the biological? That's okay if you all start to yeah, get you, you think of the fruit of the Spirit, and it yeah. looks different in different people, right? Yeah. But it's the same, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, all of that mm -hmm. is going to show itself. Mm -hmm. Maybe in the strength of a woman may be different in some ways than the strength of a man mm -hmm. tends to be different. And there's some modern day studies about what happens in different spheres in the brain, in right. the male yes. and female brain. There are some studies in leadership and social sciences about how yes. men lead and how women lead. Yeah, and that's true. So there's some soft evidence there must there. be something there mm -hmm, mm -hmm. no i mean i remember even years ago um reading the studies that say that, that girl infants and boy infants if you show them faces or mm -hmm. pictures of things that they can chart where their eyes go and their eyes go different places i mean i saw one study i don't know whether it's held up you know the real problem is, is every 10 years all these social yeah. studies start to change mm -hmm. but girl babies will tend to look at the whole face and the boy babies will look at parts of it mm -hmm. and so there does seem to be something pretty deeply wired in that's beyond just the biological uh, reproductive thing so why do you think the bible then will say there's a difference between maleness and femaleness and therefore in marriage you need to be unite reuniting you might say the non-reproducible glories of the two genders. Hmm. There's hmm. things that I can't see or do 
that my wife can see and do, and there's things that I can see and do that she can't, and that in marriage you're uniting those non-reproducible glories, yet the Bible never really tells you what those yeah. things are. So I think that's actually fairly wise. What do you think? Yeah, yeah no, I do too. What I'm wondering is what if somebody says, well, maybe the reproduction, the, the multiplication of the species is the issue. Maybe that is the main thing. Otherwise, what do you say to a single person who says, you mean I'm not in the likeness of God? Well, the problem with focusing on the reproduction piece is I know too many people that can't have babies. So does that then mean they can't represent the image of God in the world because they can't multiply? Of course not. Plus the scriptures put high value on some people remaining single Mm -hmm. to give their full devotion and life to God. They're in the likeness of God. And you can't say that marriage is better than singleness except for the multiplication of life. Right. But one comeback on that would be to say, I'm single, so you're saying I'm not haven't been completed. I mean, you know, we didn't use right. that word, but right. but sometimes in traditional circles they say you need to marry somebody to complete you because you're a male and a female completes you or you're a female yeah. and a male completes you. And then it does sound like all single people are incomplete. Mm-hmm. What I would say is imagine a church with nothing but men in it or nothing but women in it. Not very yeah. good. No. <laughs> imagine most things like a, an entire city or an entire community that's all male or female would be really weak. Right. And if you're in any community with both men and women and they're functioning well, you're mingling the uh, unique glories of each gender anyway. Obviously, in a marriage, it's the closest possible. But the great thing about Christianity, it was the first and maybe still the one religion that its founder was unmarried, Jesus. Mm. It's not true of Muhammad or Buddha or Hmm. any of the other founders. Maybe it's leading proponent St. Yeah. Paul was uh-huh. was also single. What do you make of that? Well, I do think what it means is the ultimate family is God's family. That if you're a member mm-hmm. of God's family, you've got mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters. I mean, Paul says so. Yeah. He says well, he in, talks the, about in, the, it. Yep. in the church, mm-hmm. you know, he said treat older women as mothers and older men as fathers and yeah. others as brothers and sisters. And Jesus says something very That's similar. That's right. In Mark chapter three, he says, everyone who does my will is mm-hmm. my brother and sister. So it's saying the ultimate family is God's family. Mm -hmm. And actually, my human family, I've got a wife and children and they have wives and children, is really just a kind of subset of God's family. So if you're a single, you're in the family. You may not be doing one of the subsets of that kind. Mm -hmm. And that's extraordinarily comforting, especially in my part of the woods where actually the church, even up to two years ago when I left Redeemer, the majority of people were single. Wow. Mm -hmm. Even when we were massive, we had thousands of people, the, the great majority were single. That's yeah. why nobody ever said at Redeemer, when are we going to have a singles ministry? I said, look around you. <laughs> <laughs> we are a singles ministry. <laughs> Nevertheless, I think that's your answer, Mart, is that we are completing each other, but especially in God's family, because there is, I think, hmm. that's where we're supposed to be holding each other accountable, talking to each other. We're supposed to be confessing our sins to each other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a kind of intimacy that happens in God's family, yeah. apart from marriage, that mm-hmm. probably doesn't happen in the broader community. I don't think you have that same brother-sister relationship anywhere else, except maybe in your own extended okay, family. Okay, so if that's the ultimate expression of God's glory, the body. and that kind of a, of a family sense mm-hmm. of relationship and intimacy, could it be that we have put too much emphasis on marriage and family? Um, just because I've gotten around, when I lived out in the normal world, I guess the normal American <laughs> world. The normal world. The, the normal American world where... Hmm. Most people are married and having children, and the singles tend to hightail it off to the big city because they're tired of being told once they're 27 years old and unmarried, when are you going to get married? They're just tired of it, so they go to the cities. And very often in the big cities, I see people the other way around, which is too afraid of marriage. Mm -hmm. Mm. And yet, out in the so-called normal world, we do make an idol out of it. Mm -hmm. We say, Mm -hmm. you're not a real person unless you're married. And Mm -hmm. No, Christianity ought to be able to say... You can be single and be absolutely, completely self-realized as a Christian without being married. Yeah, so, but still in relationships. Plenty of relationships. That's why there's nothing wrong with being long-term single, is if you really have the family relationships that you wouldn't have elsewhere, any other place. And you would need relationships to complement one another in men and women. Yeah. And they evidence the image of God yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah. And see, what's interesting, this word, I will make a helper suitable for him, mm. of course, the trouble with that word in English is it sounds like Santa's little helper. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's pretty well known now that the Hebrew word there, ezer, 
is a military word that means reinforcements. Mm -hmm. It means like you're losing the battle mm -hmm. and suddenly in come the reinforcements and now I win the battle. And she's so, the woman. That's right. And the woman is the person who's the reinforcements. Yeah. You're going to lose without the woman. But on the other hand, when you go to Ephesians 5 where it says, uh, husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church, gave himself and helped her with her blemishes and all that. It's clear the husband's supposed to be a helper to the wife too. There you go. Yeah. There you go. But it does come back to this idea that male and female, though in every culture and in every, I think, marriage, it manifests itself differently. That's why the Bible's so yeah. wise yeah. not to lay down a rigid set mm -hmm. of yeah. detailed right. behaviors. For that, male. For female. males or females, because the difference is there, but it manifests itself very differently yeah. mm -hmm. in different ways, times, places, and cultures. But we still need to unite them. And you do unite them in the church. Mm -hmm. And you may unite them in your marriage. Yeah, in this episode of the Discover the Word podcast, we're reflecting back on a great conversation Discover the Word group members Marty Hahn, Elisa Morgan, and Daniel Ryan Day had with the late Tim Keller. We're talking about the first Christian sexual revolution that Jesus and his followers began 2,000 years ago and how that continues to shape and influence our world today. And so to close this conversation, Tim took us to one of the key passages in the New Testament about marriage that demonstrates why using the word revolutionary is not an over-the-top stretch in describing how different it was from the prevailing views of the Roman world in the first century and how even in our day, it's still pretty countercultural. So our theme for the entire week has been that when Christianity burst onto the scene in the first century, it spoke about many, many things, but one of the things it brought was a revolutionary view of sexuality. Christianity still has something very important to say to the world because it's still revolutionary. It will revolutionize <laughs> your life as well. Yeah, we will wrap up our look back at this special conversation with Tim Keller, after we take a moment to look ahead to what the group will be studying together in our next podcast. Next time on the Discover the Word podcast, we're going to begin a study through Paul's New Testament letter to the first century church in Philippi. We'll do it in four parts, devoting one episode to each chapter, and we hope to come to a deeper understanding of the important message of this part of Scripture. Now, Rasul Berry will set the context for us and lead the group through chapter one and his focus on joy. Bill Crowder guides us through chapter two and the important countercultural ideas about servanthood and servant leadership and what's called the kenosis. Daniel has chapter three, the beware of the dogs chapter. And then Elisa will close out the study in the episode about chapter four and bring clarity to the I can do all things statement that we find there. All right, so looking forward to studying another entire book of the Bible together over the course of our next four Discover the Word podcasts. And now here's the final part of this conversation that we had back in 2019 with Tim Keller about what he called the first Christian sexual revolution. Let's read the uh, very famous passage uh, at the very end of Ephesians 5, it's 31 and 32, where Paul really shows what a profound mystery marriage is. Who wants to read that? I would love to, may okay. I? Mm -hmm. For this reason, it's because we're members of the body, I guess. Anyway, for this reason, mm -hmm. a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Hmm. It's really fascinating that whenever Paul talks about the word mystery, it actually means the gospel. When he talks about a mystery that has now been revealed, he always means the Old Testament talked about it in sort of indirect ways, but now the gospel of Jesus Christ saves us by his grace has been revealed. So it's intriguing that he looks at marriage and says, this is a great mystery. Mm -hmm. So he must be meaning that somehow marriage is actually a kind of foretaste of the gospel or it, it, should be, it needs to be a kind of image of the gospel, and we've been saying all week, all along, that uh, sex needs to be in marriage between a man and a woman because God's saving love, first of all, always comes to us only in exclusive union with him, mm -hmm. and it also unites difference. Just like a man and a woman is brought together, even by the fact that we're deeply different, mm -hmm. so God and humanity is brought together. 
So so what happens in Saving Love is two very different beings, God and humanity, are brought together like male and female, Mm. and they're brought together into an exclusive covenantal relationship with no one else, and therefore sex needs to be between a man and woman inside a covenant of marriage and nowhere else. And then Paul says, has the audacity to say, if you understand this and you practice this, it gets you in touch with something cosmic. This is a profound mystery. Marriage tells you about the gospel, and the gospel helps you understand marriage. Now, the world doesn't understand that. It sees sex as kind of an appetite. It sees it as just a way of self-fulfilling pleasure. And yet the Bible says, no, actually sex and marriage is something very sacred. Mm -hmm. Let me read you a recent article from the New York Times, and then I'm just going to ask you to respond. Just what do you see there? How do you respond Mm -hmm. to that? What do you think? This is a woman writing in the New York Times, and she describes a sexual encounter with a man she met on Tinder. What does that mean? Tinder is a site where you can meet people, and sometimes it leads to dating relationships, and sometimes it doesn't have to. So you basically find people that want to hook up, usually yep. sex, but not necessarily, mm-hmm. but often. So she meets a guy on Tinder. She was 30 years old or so, and he was like 24. And she was surprised at how the younger men had changed. She said... Uh, They began to make love, and he began to ask for my consent about virtually everything. He asked for consent for every single thing he took off. Mm. And then she said, I realized that a dramatic shift had taken place in the sexual training of younger men, so that they had to repeatedly ask for verbal consent. I was not used to being taken care of in that way, and I liked it. It had a very intimate feel. Later, however, when she texted him after they'd had sex... He never answered. Mm. He ghosted her. By the way, the name of the article was Consent to Touch, Not to Ghost. And what's ghost Mm. mean? Ghost means, uh, would you like to tell a a younger man? (laughs) Ghosting is when you think you have some kind of connection with someone, but then they fall off the face of the map and you never hear from them again. They act like ghosts. In other words, they just disappear. They don't say, sorry, I can't talk. And it doesn't have to be in Mm. a sexual thing. It could be anywhere. your your sister could ghost you for a while or something like that. That's right. But what happened was, this is a very educational lesson we're doing here (laughs) for us older people. But what happened was she felt it was so intimate and she liked it and then he just didn't answer her. And when she told her roommates or other girl roommates how hurt she was, they just laughed. Uh Because he asked for my consent, I said, over and over, sex felt like a sacred act. Mm a reciprocal offering, and then he disappeared, and they still laughed. And then this is how she ended it. She says, in the days and weeks afterwards, I was left thinking that our culture's current approach to consent is too narrow. Consent doesn't work if we relegate it exclusively to sex and the body. Our bodies are only one part of the complex constellation of who we are. To base our culture of consent on the body alone is to expect that caretaking involves only the physical. I wish we could view consent as something that's more about complete care for the other person. Because I don't think many of us would say yes to the question, Mm -hmm. is it okay if I act like I care about you and then disappear? Wow. I think in various ways, this woman who's a secular person is Mm -hmm. sensing intuitively what we've been talking about all week. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I love her holistic approach to Mm -hmm. what union and true intimacy means. Whereas the young man, it sounds to me like he was simply self-protecting. Exactly. Mm -hmm. There was more in the article than I read. She realized it seemed very intimate and caring, and Mm -hmm. then she realized it was Mm -hmm. all about him. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. You're right, Mark. She realized in hindsight, it was nothing intimate about it. It was not about me. It was all about him. So maybe what was born in her and recognized was a desire for a more holistic intimacy. Yeah, because she said he was giving me his body, but not any part of himself. And she yeah. may never known that she, that's, that's right. what she really wanted. There was no care there. Yeah. There was no love there. But I'm not sure she, I don't know, I just felt like it was a discovery for her. Yeah. yeah. And she was surprised by this consent request over and over. And it felt the way you read it, Tim, that, that something was being revealed to her in herself, a deeper need. Yeah. Because even in the process, she felt like this was really weird Mm -hmm. and it wasn't until reflecting on it afterwards Mm -hmm. that she realized she wanted something more than she had originally signed up for i think what she was sensing when she said consent's got to be more than just physical 
I give you physical consent. And it says, the body's only one part of, I loved it, this is at least what you're saying, the body's only one part of the constellation of who we are, mm-hmm. which of course is what we've been saying all week. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That you can't just say, well, here's my soul, here's my body. The body doesn't really matter. What matters is myself or my soul. Mm-hmm. No, it's all part of you. And she says, to ask for my body and to give me your body, but not give me your whole self, feels like, I feel violated. Yeah, That's where she says it feels sacred. She's intuiting mm-hmm. the Christian idea, which is mm-hmm. you should never give your body without giving your whole self. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Because you are an entirety. You must never give yourself physically without giving yourself emotionally and spiritually and legally and economically. Yeah, yeah. And I think to put it in the positive, because <laughs> those are important delineations you're making, in the positive, maybe she's discovering she was made for something more. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if that's why, in so many ways, we can find ourselves at times feeling sterile, like our spirituality is not all that meaningful Mm -hmm. because of what we're withholding. Mm -hmm. I'm struck thinking (laughs) about the greatest command and the one like it. Mm -hmm. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mm -hmm. And here we are talking Mm -hmm. about the physical strength. Yeah. We're talking about the emotions, the heart. Mm. Right. We've talked Excellent. about the soul. Yeah. <laughs> and she's thinking about this yeah. afterwards. And so her mind is involved. And what she's realizing is that this relationship that she wanted mm. was something that requires heart, soul, mind, and strength, mm-hmm. and not just strength, not right. just the physical. Yeah. And for both sides. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we can feel sterile too, I think, if we're trying to do all the loving and not realizing that he has first given yeah. his mind, soul, exactly. body. Literally. Yeah, and mm-hmm. actually in some ways much more than we ever mm-hmm. yeah. will give ourselves to each other. I mean, mm-hmm. there are, are people who have died for their spouses, yeah. I'm sure mm-hmm. to save their spouses' lives, but the vast majority of us have not done no. that. Mm-hmm. But Jesus did that for us and yeah. we are his spouse. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very dramatic illustration when you pause and consider the turn that you're suggesting, Mart and Tim. Mm-hmm. It's very dramatic at how we withhold. Yeah. You know, and, and in a way, God, in the most appropriate, meaningful way, is asking yeah. for consent. He said, I remember C.S. Lewis talking about him as a gentleman, you know, and I think yeah. that's profound. Yeah. But he really does long for that kind of relationship yeah. with us. But if he didn't, why in the world would we love him? <laughs> I mean, I think so often we're trying to love someone we have no idea yeah. the extent to which he has first gone. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Can we read those last verses again? Yeah. Is this the right time? Please. Because it's profound when you put it in the context we've just talked mm-hmm. about. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. Here, here, here. But <laughs> I'm talking about Christ and the church. His unconditional love for us is the thing that should reassure us so deeply that when I feel like my own love is running dry because my wife isn't being what she ought to be, for Mm. example, or maybe I'm not being what I ought to be, and Mm. therefore I feel guilty about it, I have to fall back Mm -hmm. on Christ's love, and then it enables me to love my wife. Mm. Put it this way. I fairly often fall into loving Kathy more than I love God, or her love for me is more important than God's love for me. When that happens, Mm. I fail to love Kathy well. I start putting pressure on her, yeah. She's right. got to always be okay, never be, have a bad day. Mm-hmm. She's always got to be affirming me because she's like my God. And what's so weird is until I really let Jesus spouse the love for me, be the ultimate source of my joy and my, my identity, I can't love my wife well. If I love her more than God, I will love her terribly. And if I love God more than her and, and rest in this more than I rest in anything else, I will love her so much better. Mm. And that's the irony and paradox, but the beauty of uh, Christian marriage. The mystery of the first sexual revolution, right? Yeah, the first sexual revolution. And I would add, in some ways, the second sexual revolution, which is the one we've had since the 60s, is actually not moving forward, but to some degree it's retrograde. Because going back to the idea that sex is just an appetite and sex is just a way of getting Mm -hmm. self-fulfillment and it's really no big deal, And I don't think Christians ought to be embarrassed about holding on to a view of sex which is so lofty. Mm -hmm. There's a sense in which the Christian sexual ethic is kind of restrictive. You know, (laughs) no sex out there, out there, no, inside marriage. 
But the vision of sex is so much more lofty. Sex is supposed to be a signpost and a foretaste of our communion with God and the saving love of God. And so the high vision uh, is something that Christians should not retreat from mm -hmm. and not be told, oh, you know, you're out of step. You're going to have to get with the program. You're going to have to change your views of sex ethics to get with the program. You know, Christians were out of step in the Roman Empire, and we really changed history. And we're out of step today, but there's no reason to go back. Thank you for being here, Tim. I think you've blown our little minds out a little bit broader <laughs> on this topic. And thank you. Hope you found these conversations about the first Christian sexual revolution that we had with Tim Keller as compelling as we did. Uh, this was a memorable series of conversations Mark DeHaan, Elisa Morgan, and Daniel Ryan Day had with Tim back in September of 2019, just before Tim's cancer diagnosis. Uh, so thankful we were able to spend time with him and so thankful to the Lord for how he used Tim Keller to influence our generation for Christ. Now, Discover the Word is a small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures, challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ, and always point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. Now, the conversations we have on this podcast represent a group effort in more ways than one. Not only is this a group discussion, and not only do we have a great team that puts these programs together, but we also rely on the voluntary donations from friends like you to make this podcast possible. And so we invite you to partner with us financially in this Bible engagement outreach of Our Daily Bread Ministries. Just go to discovertheword.org and look for the Donate button in the top right corner of our homepage. Well, thanks for listening. I'm Brian Hedinga. Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministries. Music